Hello again, everyone. It's Wednesday night. It's time for Q&A with A and V. I am Vincent Racaniello, and joining me from New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Hey, Amy. Okay, now there is an echo. You didn't push the button. Oh, I, I have it set just the way it was last time. No, because there's an echo. It's not put, right? it's not in. Well, listeners out there, um, tell us if you hear uh, an echo. We have 127 listeners. You hear an echo? Do you hear me at all? Audio is fine here. No, that you hear no an echo. echo. It must be. Are you running uh, the YouTube separately in a window? I don't think so. Check your tabs. Can, all right. Check your tabs. Okay, Everyone says so. it sounds fine. You're good? Okay. I'm good now. Before we get started, folks, I wanted to give you an update. <laughs> no F-bombs today. Yes. <laughs> it was working. Um, I wanted to give you an update on the uh, studio. I went to the studio this morning to meet the construction supervisor. No, the construction manager, CM. Yeah. And uh, he started the demolition, and we just had to make sure that everything was right. So let me show you a couple of pictures. Uh, here is one of, um, so that you can't see a lot, but this is one wall of the studio. The doorway is behind me. You can see they've removed a lot of the walls. It's going to be clean by the time they're done. Uh, and then the same room, here's the left view. So we were just looking at that wall on the right. Uh, this is the left view. We have two windows here in this room. There's a wall on the left. So this is quite a nice space that I'm going to set up um, for interviews and also for streaming and video making and so forth. Obviously, this will be all cleaned out. And I needed to get straight with him the Ethernet and the, the uh, AC outlets. And then, let's see, uh, the other room. This is the other room, kind of the office part. We have a little office here for, for our administrator. Uh, then there's a little kitchen here with a sink and some cabinets. There'll be a refrigerator. This wall is is coming out around here. And then this this wall will all come out. So we'll have just a little indent here. Unfortunately, this is a column. We can't take that out. And then to the left, there's the electrical closet. So what they have to do, obviously, is finish demoing, uh, patch the walls, repaint put a new rug in and fix up the electricity and the internet, and then we'll be all set to uh, move in maybe in a month or so. And uh, as always, thank you, Amy, for for facilitating it's all good. of this. And, and this morning, folks, I took New Jersey Transit to the studio, and that's the way I'm going to start commuting. It was really good. And I walked two blocks to the studio from... It's the shortest commute I've ever had. It's, a, it's awesome. I love it. You don't think that's right, Amy? I'm trying to think about when you lived on the east side. Um, it was a little more than two blocks. Yeah. I also want to tell everyone, so Friday on TWIV, we have a special guest, Lori Garrett. So uh, if you have any particular questions for Dr. Garrett. Actually, not Dr. Lori Garrett. She didn't finish her PhD, apparently. Uh, just send them in. Yeah, she's willing to stay with us for two hours. That should be interesting, right, Amy? For sure. I mean, I'm not participating, but yeah. I mean, I think she has interesting things to say. She has an interesting perspective. For sure. And um, She's not going to get lost in the weeds of the science. She's going to have a more uh, socio-psychological, economic point of view. Political too, right? Yeah. Well, isn't that included? Yeah, included in the socio. Yeah. And she doesn't really have anything to lose. So she can be yeah. bluntly honest about, you know, how she feels that, the public health infrastructure has either risen to the occasion or fell into the abyss. Thank you very, Nika, for your contribution. 
good. Oh, which reminds me, I want to thank Marion um, for the postcards from Brittany. They were lovely. Oh, yes, they were very pretty. Mm -hmm. Jefferson Space, thank you very much. We're glad that you like it. Janice Excellent. wants us to chat briefly about the Delta Plus variant and its implications with mRNA vaccines. Can't you just read our op-ed piece? <laughs> so Amy and I have auth have written an op-ed uh, for the New York Times. It's going through their review process, but it looks like they're going to publish it. The um, What's the title? Do we have a title? Yeah, but I don't remember. It's in detail. They're about the variants and how the narrative has not been correct. So the Delta Plus, the, the vaccines will prevent moderate to lethal disease with the Delta variant. Uh, so just get vaccinated and you'll be good. The, what you hear in the mainstream media about the variant evading vaccines is simply not true. Uh, that's both my and Amy's and many others' conclusions. Yeah, unfortunately, the mainstream media has gotten their information from people who, um, while in the echelons of power, may not be the best authorities to have answered this question. And they also have, they, they are conflicted. <laughs> uh, For sure. um, so, you know, because, uh, you know, you saw how Biden had to step back, like his his administration had to announce today that he's not going to meet his goal of 70 percent getting partially vaccinated. Right. Mm, right. So the people who are in charge of that at certain agencies have to figure out how to market it to get you to get vaccinated and claiming you know, the sky is falling is one way to do it. No. Yep. Yep. And, for sure. But that's not necessarily the correct science. What's the contribution of platelets in COVID-19? I don't know. What do you think, Amy? Um, so there is a little connection. It's not well thought flushed out and Daniel has alluded to it about vaccines reducing platelet numbers, mm -hmm. but um, it's by far not flushed out at all. It's just a few observations. Um, and I know this because this came up when one of my parents who is anemic um, and has low platelets was vaccinated, but really there's, it's just, anecdotal and anecdotal observation what about in COVID itself though is there any evidence for platelet involvement there is some clotting with, with there's you know, clotting yeah. but it's not clear what that clotting is because it's different so you can't dissociate it with heparin which yeah. is usually the target that you use for platelets i think that this points out the difficulty of getting answers very quickly right this is a brand new disease and it's going to take a while to get answers. Not It's not going to happen in a year. Yes. Unfortunately, while you figure it out, many people die and others are inconvenienced in a fashion, right? Of course. They're, they can't go to concerts and do things. And as we heard this afternoon from the guy at the clinical lab, you know, you walk outside this area and they're like, oh, just throw away your mask. Nothing really happened. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. I have a Twitter page devoted to COVID. Because of TWIV, I forward your episodes to every week. Thank you, Rock of Ages. It's appreciated that, you know, That's everyone great. has to has to help because we do this um, organically. We don't have any publicity. Right, Amy? <laughs> Is that what organically means? No publicity? Oh, yeah. Then, it, yeah, that's true. I don't know what organic means, but well, yeah. To me, it uh, means so, it hap you do you just do your thing and it happens. You're not making an effort to, to promote or push something, right? That's what I think is organic. I could be wrong. I don't know, but if that's fine, that's what you're using. All right, so Carl says, latest uh, growth of new infections seems to be leveling off in the UK. 
a bit surprised that we seem to be getting complacent. Well, if well, there are two factors. There's immunity conferred by infection and vaccination. Mm-hmm. And then there's the effect of the, the climate, right? It's, um, yeah, probably... but I don't, I don't think it's the climate. I think it's really uh, you're starting, like, the fact that they have some, they're beyond a certain, they're not at 70% Im- vaccinated, but they're beyond some little number where you start to see some effect. Yeah. My niece is concerned about getting the vaccine while breastfeeding. What can I tell her? Get the vaccine. It protects the child, too. Get the vaccine. So you can't immunize your child, you know, anything, anyone under 12, but you can passively immunize your child by breastfeeding while you've been vaccinated. So, yes, there's no there's no negative for sure. I tell my friend who's pregnant, who's due on my birthday, get the vaccine so that she can protect her kid. For sure. Okay, Mike says, iron dysregulation causing damage lipid peroxidation from COVID-19 has led to possible treatments with iron chelators. Could low iron also be preventative and explain who gets it severe? I don't know anything about iron and COVID. Do you, Amy? So Craig was talking about iron sulfites and their role in certain proteins that are required for replication and for viral replication and stuff and uh, how we replace them with zinc sometimes. Um, And there was an iron sulfite paper in cell about uh, COVID, but I haven't had time to read it, so... And it, he, he cites a study, the role of iron in the pathogenesis of COVID and possible treatment with lactoferrin. Yeah, we haven't seen that, but we'll take a look at it so we can talk yeah. about it next time for sure. Mm-hmm. Buenos Aires, post-polio news is here. It's Any great. thoughts on the CureVac trial? Now, that's the one where it didn't work well and... Um, you know, it's a, it's an mRNA without any modifications, right, Amy? Right. That's why it doesn't work so well. Well, that's the thought, but, right? Yeah. Well, I think that there is some data. But you, that percentage, you would say, is pretty close to the percentage that made Sabin or Salk very efficient in getting rid of polio, right? Yeah. 47 so if I had a choice of zero vaccine or CureVac vaccine, I'm pretty much picking CureVac vaccine. Yes. In Chile, they had uh, also similar issues. But, you know, people tend to blame the variants, but it's not the variants. It's just the, the efficacy is low, and it's probably because the mRNA is not modified. So we'll see. Okay, this is one we've talked about before, Amy. Do you think COVID would be similar to human corona OC43? Today we know this virus caused 10% of cases of common cold. So the idea is with these common cold coronas, they originally spilled over from, I think, two from bats and two from rodents. Maybe they yeah. caused the pandemic when they did, and we don't know because it's lost in history. And now they are pretty benign. Yeah, and maybe COVID is going to have a similar fate. We just don't know. No, but right. I'm, no, but that's the prediction. I'm fine with it being the prediction. Look at this. There's a San Francisco face group book group for TWIV. Cool. That's cool. If we ever go, well, we should all get together. That would be cool. Uh, vaccine efficiency for variants drop because epitope changes. But efficacy between vaccine platforms versus variants also vary. Is it with your best guess because quantity or shape of antibody produced? Are you talking about between the different um, vaccine platforms? Hard to compare, right, Amy? Um, sure. My feeling is that what you really want to look at, efficacy has to always be defined, and you can't just say efficacy. You have to say what your endpoint is. Is it any infection? Is it mild, moderate, severe death? And 
my my understanding from the data is that moderate to severe disease death included is prevented by any variant by the vaccines. And really that's what's important. Yeah, I think like a lot of the difference is also not really a difference. I mean, there's really, you say, oh, well, against the ancestral, it was 94%. Against this one, it's 92.6%. It's really not a difference. No, that is if I difference. came to you, If I came to you with my plaque assay results and said that, you'd just be like, there's no difference, AB. By the way, I just want to show this to everyone. This is um, The Coming Plague, right, by Lori yes. Garrett. And this no, was you're written. too close. You should push it away so people can see the whole block. Yeah, yeah. I could put it right next to my head. Look at that. Tilt it. And sure. Model look into it. the camera. <laughs> yeah, you could be the Price is Right model for this. And she wrote this and published in 1995, and um, it was pretty prescient. That was an early early time for emerging infection. It'd be fun to talk to Lori. She's definitely well, I wonder, opinionated. I wonder what the um, inspiration was. Was it like... The, the emergence of HIV was it some flu outbreak? I wonder what the emergence was. What that so it's a inspiration? Duration, was. Yeah, one of my first questions. Yeah, I'm assuming recombination requires infection of the same cell. Correct. Combination between different viruses, right? Is binding entry more important than subgenus? <laughs> oh, is it? I don't get it. I know. I think the the subgenus is the most important as long as they get in, and uh, yeah, because there's. I not... don't get the connection. Yeah, I mean, like what, I don't what's get... the what's the most important for determining whether recombination will occur between two viruses? Is it whether they bind and enter similarly, or their genetic? Oh, I don't care makeup? if they bind and enter similarly. It's whether yeah. or not the progeny is going to be infectious, right? Yeah, and it complements the defect. There are some viruses that you can get recombinant, I'm sure, but they don't complement the defect, so they're lethal. Agreed. What surrogate, and by the way, if you want to ask us a question, either Vincent or Amy, that way we, we avoid your chats. What surrogate do you think we should use to decide when antibody level waned low enough to need a booster? you have any thoughts on that, Amy? Um, when they're no longer, well, no, because many times you don't have detectable antibodies, but you have a memory B cell response so that when you get infected and you have a memory T cell response so that when you get infected the second time, the memory T cell response is very rapid and that allows for the time that's required for the memory B cells to be income engaged. So there's really no way to have a surrogate. To d it really doesn't have to do with antibody levels waning. It would have to do about how much variation there is in the virus. Like if it's completely different, like if the spike now, you know, looks like a hairy green monster instead of skinny bright Barbie. I don't know. but Yeah, I think part of the answer is that if, there's no antibody, then that would suggest there are no memory B cells, and that would be bad. But it, if there's always a low level of antibody, that then, only depends on the level of detection of your test. And no, I'm not course, sure that we well, I'm not sure that we have ever developed a test that's sense enough to say there's less than one ant, that there's less that the antibody is sufficient to pick up one PFE. Yeah, for sure. Um, we should bring Dr. Roger Sehult from MedCram on. I, I, I've corresponded with him. What, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it depends what he does, right? He does a whole range of medicine. I'm not sure if he, is he an ID doc or is he a medical doc, you know, internal medicine. I'm not sure. Um, Vanity is working tonight, but she might be listening. You know, she could sneak off and look at her phone. Well, she just has it on headphones. Hey, Amy, did you get your quality wine? No. <laughs> it's okay. 
Okay, Mike, another question. You got us. Have you talked about the study out of Japan showing the movement of the vaccine? Does the lipid particle move into the bone marrow? How would it get into the bone marrow? I don't, I don't know why you would assume it's going in the bone marrow. Yeah. How would I mean, it get could, that? Well, could, isn't there circulation that would bring it in, Amy, or no? Um, I mean, it's, there it's, are some it, capillaries in the bone yeah. marrow, but I mean, it's basically fenestrated. Um, but even before, okay, so you inoculate the vaccine into your deltoid. Your, the goal is not to put it intravenously. The goal is to put it into the muscle cell and mm -hmm. have the muscle cell produce the protein. And it's not clear to me that even if it spilled, even if you missed and it got into the blood, that the particle would not be um, damaged by the acid of the blood. So it's not really clear to me how it would get to the bone marrow. Uh, can we go over the HPV vaccine? Why didn't we have it earlier? Earlier so they, than what? Then we had it. Oh. So part of the issue was, you know, there was cervical and anogenital cancers. And, and the association with uh, human papillomaviruses was made in the 80s by, um, what's his name, the guy I interviewed. He won the prize for it. Yeah, and I interviewed him. It was a lovely interview, HPV Nobel Prize. His name like is three people. Harold Zurhausen. Uh, yeah, and that's the same year that uh, two individuals got it for um, HIV. That's uh, Mont Luc Montagnier and uh, François Barry Sinousse. Um, anyway, so it took that until the 80s to figure out the connection between HPVs and cancer. And then making a vaccine was not straightforward because you could not propagate the virus in cells and culture in the laboratory. That's a kind of a tough obstacle, right? So then they decided, well... Let's try producing the viral proteins, and they settle in the capsid protein, and they put it in insect cells and in yeast, and it assembled into empty capsids. So I said, let's go with this. So they adjuvanted it, and they did clinical trials, and it's gangbusters vaccine. Really? What? One, go ahead. No, go ahead. One of the few human vaccines that actually prevents infection. Such high levels of antibodies are induced in the mucosa. So that's a brief story of the HPV vaccine. And now there are multiple. So there are only, you know, there are over 150 serotypes of human papillomaviruses that cause warts. And only a few of them are associated with cancer. You know, I don't know, less than 20. Four? Four. Four of the main ones. And yeah, then from they, salt. And then they have included some others. And different GlaxoSmithKline, Merck make these vaccines. It, all in, in heterologous systems, insect cells or yeast, and they're, they're empty capsids. Really good. Is Pepper now done barking? <laughs> Did you hear? Yeah. This is why I have to go to a studio. My dogs bark at the sight of a deer outside the window. Cell paper on animal surveys. That's the one that Amy was on. Only sampled 411 bats. This is a drop in the bucket. No. Yeah, it's not a lot of bats. I'm not even sure it's a full cave worth of bats, is it? Uh, no, like, think, how many bats do you think live under that disgusting bridge in Austin? No, I think uh, probably millions. Do <laughs> you think it's disgusting? Why? Because <laughs> there's a lot of bat guano there? Uh, it's just vile. Thank you, Les, for your... Yes, contribution. We will incubate some podcasts in the incubator. Yep. We will do incubators. Uh, so someone said, Dr. Seholt is a respiratory doc. I presume that means a pulmonologist. So it could be interesting. I'll look into it. I take your suggestions. Uh, someone suggested um, Lori Garrett. So there we go. 
Uh, Santiago, thank you so much for your contribution to our incubator, the incubator. How will we know VNA? That's a good way to do it, at VNA. How would we know if a variant escapes the vaccines? Will it just be more cases? Are there lab tests? Sounds like a canary in a coal mine. You, know, you have to survey vaccinated people and see the incidence of disease, right? Whether it's moderate or severe or mild. And that's what's being done. That's what they do for influenza every year, right? They notice, they look to see if there's a good um, coverage of the current vaccine with the currently circulating viruses, variants of influenza virus. And then they, they make a decision whether to change the flu vaccine based on neutralization, actually inhibition of hemagglutination. So... I was going to say what neutralization. It has nothing to do with neutralization. And yeah, they don't do somebody notes. should delete the cell type specific 89. You're responsible for millions of deaths. It was a lab leak. Somebody should delete them. Uh, Frank took care of it. Thank you, Frank. Anyway, Peter, I think we're going to have to do surveillance for sure, and that's already started. Okay, this is for Amy. You said that tighter receptor binding of spike might not be good for the virus since it also has to get off the receptor. Do you mean during entry or during release of new viruses? Could be both. Yeah, because on the way out, if it sticks to the receptor too tightly, it wouldn't get out of the cell, right? Right. That's why flu has HA. NA. It cleaves sialic, NA, sorry. It cleaves yep. sialic acid, right? So. All right, here we have our, you said, um, what did I say? Any iso, not you, just Krister, any isopathology between CSF virus and ASF, classical swine fever, African swine fever, and SARS CoV 2, such as elevated zonulin? I'm not aware of it. So these are um, swine viruses, obviously. And I'm not aware of any studies on zonulin in them. That's a good question, though. Oh, thank you. I uh, got these a couple of weeks ago. They're reading glasses. They're Amy approved. I showed her this red and orange. She said, no, no, blue. Go with the blue. And tonight it matches my shirt. Looks and good. The coming plague was the book that inspired me to pursue a career in public health. That's terrific. That's Very great. Good. We should mark this down so that she knows. Yeah, I'll tell her. Yeah, you hear hiss because... Um, well, there are a lot of reasons. This is not a great environment, and I haven't fixed it. I hope you'll always do some from your basement where your guitar gently weeps. The Wednesday live streams I'm going to always do from here because they're 8 p.m., and if I stayed in the studio till 9.30, I'd get home pretty late. But it could be that it's such a great studio that I want to stay there all the time. You never know. <laughs> You'll see. Yeah, I don't think you're going to become Thomas Edison. I don't see Doris setting you up in a cot. What's Thomas Edison have to do with it? So he used to work really late, and his wife was really concerned about his health and eating right and sleeping. So she set a cot up in his lap so he could take afternoon naps. Well, I have so a little sofa. In, I could put a sofa in the um, well, discuss. incubator, but not in the studio area, right? Well, discuss. Okay, Santiago wants to know, has the pandemic been blown out of proportion by politicians at the expense of the average citizen? Has it been used for political manipulation? So I don't know what blown out of proportion means. Do you mean that I understand, if you're not from the United States, I'm, this, you might not know this fact, and it will be different for your country. But do you mean that 600,000 deaths has been blown out of proportion by the by politicians at the expense of the average c citizen? I think that if one of those 600,000 deaths were in your family, you might not think so. What do you think? I think what's been blown out of proportion is the, the, the rhetoric on, well, first, lab origin and second, variants, right? Yeah, but that's um, not really the pandemic. That's just, that's like a sideshow. I don't know about political manipulation, but I do think it has been politicized for sure. Um, 
No, it's a serious pandemic, but aspects of it have been misrepresented. Let's put it that way. And that's what Amy and I's op-ed is, is about, which hopefully will come out within the next week. Well, By the I way, also I, think that the vaccines, uh, it's not just the variants. I think the vac- most importantly, the vaccines have been politicized and politicized in a way that depending on what, me- what group you're a member of, you can find very offensive. Right. I meant to say that as Amy and I have been working with the editors, they, one of them said to us, you have to write it so a five-year-old can understand it. I was kind of shocked by that, frankly. Not, I mean, I like five-year-olds. No, it's five-year-old. Right? I thought it was a fifth grader. I think that that's uh, Fifth different. grader, yes. Okay. I think that that's totally different. It is different. You think that's the average science comprehension of the Times readers? I think that's the average science comprehension of the American public. Um, If I look at my family, the majority of people are not scientists. And the one who is a biology teacher says she cannot listen to TWIV um, most of the time because the science is far beyond her comprehension. And the thing is, is she is teaching biology and honors AP biology, wherever it is. And she only has a BS in biology from Miami in Ohio. Her master's degree is in teaching. It's not in biology. It's just in teaching how you communicate to the students, I would assume. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not surprised. Uh, New York Times often pay well. Yeah, I'm sorry. It hasn't been published yet. We think it'll be published in the next week or so. And um, if you'd like to read it, just if you can't get through a paywall, let us know. We could send it to you. Uh, so I'm sure Cor- you could just put it on your virology blog. It is our opinion, right? Yeah. What's the insulation like? Do you have any noise problems? Well, um, we'll see when it's finally built they're putting they're putting uh they're taking out the drywall and they're filling it with the foam with the foam stuff so if that doesn't work i I will put up absorbing pads on the walls and i might even put blankets over the windows because sound blankets work really well uh, by the way does sars-cov-2 replicate at 39c Uh, I mean? Not to my knowledge. I don't think many viruses replicate at 39. It's really good to find honest scientists. Thank you. You're welcome. We try. And please hit like. Um, yeah, that helps because then other people might see this. And we just want to spread information. Yeah, New York Times has some of the most annoying paywall policies out there. I think you can read so many articles and then they turn it off. Yeah. We have a problem as both scientists and anti-vaxxers both are critiquing the mainstream media and politicians. General public is then left confused. Okay, so what do we do about that, Amy? I think it's a reasonable point, right? Uh, what? I'm sorry. We have a problem as both scientists and anti-vaxxers are both criticizing the mainstream media and politicians and the general public is then left confused um so what do we do about it i think it's a reasonable point we are criticizing the press although amy makes a point of saying it's not just the press it's the scientists who are saying the things right right so like for instance when we spoke to the editor today okay we had you know one of the points is so she's you, you said to her you're going to get some pushback right from the from the piece right mm-hmm. and there was the discussion about like how many you know how much pushback and you know would we kind of like implying amy would you be ready for this pushback because you're going to be an author of this piece did you think this thing through but if you look at it it's the it's the same people over and over and over again in different platforms, right? It's not really expanding. And one, 
one of the problems is that they are not um, necessarily the experts, but they like the attention. And we can say that clearly by someone's paper that people want us to discuss, right? He likes the attention. And he has, and he has the loudest voice right now and he, and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so as the media, it has set itself up for being critique, for being criticized in the fact that it has lost its perspective in that you have to tell both sides of the story. Um, and so when you actually look at some of the stories that the media just talks about that aren't science, and then you go to like the BBC or some other media, you see a different perspective because they're not, they don't, they don't have as much, it's not as skewed. And so that's really the problem is that we no longer have a political dialogue of bipartisanship and stuff in any in any field you either are this way or you're that way i'm sorry angela between scientists and the government i've almost lost my mind we don't help i'm sorry i thought we would help but that's not the way it should be it should be that the scientists and the government are on the same side because at the end of the day we're working for the people yeah. And here's your title, Variant, Scariant, and Behavior of Concern. <laughs> it's almost, that's a good one. It's very it good. It is. Um, my expectation is what we all will get reinfected, but our T cells will protect us from variants being sick or dying. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. That's the idea. And in fact, with any, most vaccines, you're going to get reinfected, but you just don't get sick. You're surprised by my choice to have Lori Garrett on TWIV? Well, people requested it, and many people requested it. What's surprising about it? Uh, yeah, she has written often about viruses, so it's okay. I don't always agree with her, for sure, but I think she could speak out. But it's not, as I just said, it's not about whether or not you agree with her. Right. It's about whether or not you can have a civil conversation in which you can understand somebody else's perspective. Right. I think in general, we do that on TWIV, right, Amy? For the most part. Everyone's freaking out here in Sydney. We have an outbreak of Delta. 30 cases. <laughs> Only 20 percent of the population has one shot. Well, there are going That's to the be. problem. Yeah. That's the problem right there. That's so the problem. Whatever virus is there, and it happens to be Delta, that's going to cause the outbreak. But 30 cases is not really much. It is an outbreak, but not really much. But the, that's not the problem. The problem is is the 20%. It, actually, the problem is the 10% of fully vaccinated. That's the problem. It's yes. not the Delta. It's not the other stuff. It's the fact that only 10% of your population is fully vaccinated. Can you please explain ADE? Antibody dependent enhancement. I guess it's best exemplified with dengue, right, Amy? It's the only one I know about. So four serotypes of dengue. Let's say you get infected with serotype one. You make antibodies to one. You have a memory response to one. Then sometime later, you get infected with dengue 2. You make a memory response to dengue 1. Those antibodies bind dengue 2, but they don't block infection. It's just the wrong serotype. And the antibodies can be pulled into cells that have receptors for the antibodies that normally wouldn't be infected by the virus. And that makes it worse. That's why the enhancement comes from. And as Amy said, that's the only example that we really have good evidence in humans. Has anyone researched whether survivors of SARS-1 contracted COVID-19? Um, I think I did see a paper uh, about that, but I can't swear by what the what the 
what the uh, take home message was. I yeah, think they, actually that they had less disease or were pretty protected, but don't quote me on that. What might be an issue with SARS-CoV-2 jumping back and forth from zoological reservoir? Well, the same thing that is the uh, issue for flu when it goes back and forth between animal reservoirs, recombinants. So, yeah, you have a reservoir in animals, you got a human variant, and the two could recombine in this case, make different viruses, but also means you can never eradicate because it's infecting non human animals. Well, polio only affects one animal, and we're not That's so good at the eradication. <laughs> <laughs> not bad. We went from a lot to very few. It's not eradicated. It's not zero. That's eradication. Zero. We, want to, we don't because zero. Amy can still work with type 1, so we don't want to eradicate. <laughs> well, the misinformation is airing me out this week. Cannot imagine how we feel. So I personally get bummed out when there's a lot of information, and I come into to the lab and I tell Amy, and she already knows about it, right? We get very bummed out that there's a lot of information. We don't know how to fix it, right? We have a small megaphone, microphone. Here's one for Amy. Seattle has recently achieved over 70% vaccination. Seattle Pride March will take place in a week. It will be the first large festival since COVID began. Any thoughts? I think it's great, but if I were going, I would still bring my mask. I would. I'd use a mask. Yeah, in a big, big community like that, I would. Yeah, I just said I would use a mask, but I would go. You're outside. It's a nice sunny day, but I would wear my mask. I mean, somebody asked if I wear my mask shopping, even though I'm vaccinated. I wear my mask shopping. Um, I wear my mask on the subway. I wear it on the bus. You have to wear it on public transportation in New York, right? Um. He's he, lifting all of the rules, and really? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember what it is, but it's not clear. Yeah, he's lifting all the rules. Because on but, New Jersey Transit today, they announced everyone needs to wear a mask. It's federal regulation. Maybe because it's interstate, where the subway yeah. is not interstate. Um, but I wear it walking down the street when I come to the lab in the morning um, and stuff. I wear it when we go to Rod's. Blah blah blah. We wore it today. You wear it in the and, lab off, even. Yeah. Especially when I walk in, you put the mask on. I put the paper bag over my head. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, Leo, a mouse question. How long does it take the mouse breeders to make up a population? Do these new mice need to get FDA approval? I don't know what new mice means or why. No, you don't need FDA approval. Um, they're not a drug or a food. Um, they are regulated by the USDA because they are animals. How long does it take mouse breeders to make up a population? I don't even really, do you know exactly what that means? So I'm like thinking... we just got two mice, right? We got four mice for PVR, right? Poliovirus receptor transgenic mice, right? And they've been upstairs for about, they came at 10 weeks old. So they've been upstairs for about eight weeks. And we've had two litter, three litters, but one was completely eaten. Um, What's the gestation think, period for a mouse, Amy? Gestation period is 21 days. And then they're sexually mature at 21 days also, right? No, you can't breed them until they're six weeks. You wean them at 21 days. Okay. So gestation is like 20 to 21 days because you're never 100% sure. Then you wean them three weeks after birth, and then another three weeks is when you can first breed them. That gives you an idea. If you start with two, you can rapidly expand. So we have we started with four PVR transgenics. How many do we have now? Um, a few dozen? No, 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 no. We have now a total of 10. You see, in our case, we have to make sure the transgene is present, which means we have to take a little tissue from the mouse and do a PCR so it slows it down. Well, that, well, 
our litter was seven and four were positive, three were not. And all four that were positive were female. Yes, which is not good. Well, the people sent us all males that were positive with zero females that were positive. Yeah. Not so good either. So that means then the offspring will all have only just only one copy of the gene. So then you have to breed them again to get two, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right. It's 845. I can do two more and then I have to add overlay and split some cells. So to have, have grassroots, to grassroots growth without the fertilizer. That's organic. There you go. Uh, well, well, I don't throw any shit, so, I mean, <laughs> isn't that fertilizer? It is. Okay, so. Um, will we see any animals that can be infected have higher than normal deaths? Uh, well, you know, with the mink in in the Netherlands and, and uh, Denmark, they noticed they were getting sick and had a higher than normal mortality, yes. So that's one way. But if it's a wild animal, it might be hard to see, right? Might be hard to see, but the other thing is death is an inadvertent consequence. I'm not sure that deer mice are dying. No, we don't know. We don't know how uh, exactly right. Okay, any comment on the Bloom Lab preprint? Uh, is this the last one? Uh, this has to be the last one because this is going to take a while. Okay. Because this is a disaster. This is yeah. an utter disaster. In what sense? Is it good or bad or neutral? Let me ask you this, Amy. Does good, Bloom's bad, or neutral? And it's definitely not good, and it's definitely not neutral. So, does it support the lab leak notion? Ah, <laughs> uh, if the lab leak notion is to continue to perpetuate a country and a population of people as liars yes if the lab leak notion is to have some kind of science no yeah, i mean that's what it does it perpetuates the 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 connotation that this country and the people who live in this country and are of that group are liars cannot be trusted and they that and they should be the basically the target of our hate and you can mm -hmm. have biased crimes against them and be justified, basically, is what this paper does. Scientifically, it doesn't do anything. No, it doesn't do anything. And, the, 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 you know, one of the aspects of the paper is that apparently some sequences that were submitted to an NIH server by a lab in China were withdrawn. And, and Bloom seems to think that this is a sign that something was being hidden. But it turns you know, out that... It turns out that there's a, the article in both the Times and the Journal have discussed this both today because of this. And it turns out that when you talk to the NIH, they say that the senior author of that paper asked them to remove the sequences because they had revised versions or updated annotations of the sequence and put, didn't want them in that, this database because they put them in a different database so that people would not get confused, which could be, which is perfectly reasonable for you to do. And I have to say that, for instance, some of the 68 sequences has, um, my hubris is not outstanding. I'm not particularly arrogant, but thank you, mindful munchkin. <laughs> um, but the sequence. It, 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 outstanding. He says it's outstanding. He likes it. No, I don't think it's a compliment. The arrogance is outstanding, meaning it's, meaning it's outrageous. Like, she's way too arrogant, but that's fine. Um, and Will, Will Barrow should also be removed. The lab leak hypothesis to Holocaust denial depends on what group you're in, but no, that wasn't the exact analogy. Um, but sequences for EV68 have been corrected. Mm -hmm. And you corrected yeah. polio sequence because you missed the BAM site. Yep. Yeah, it happens all the time. There's nothing right. to it. But in the end, having these sequences doesn't give you any more information except that the virus was probably circulating earlier. And we already know that from a previous analysis. 
Right. So, so as I said, scientifically, it does not, it did not do anything. It, but socio, sociologically, it does do something that is, that should not, one should not strive to do. I think that's a good topic for, um, Laurie Garrett, Laurie Garrett, right? Yeah. You know, what's, how do you, what are the, what are the, what are the effects of, you know, accusing a country of lying, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Right. It's the, how do you set in this day and age, how are you going to separate the, the actual science science from, um, you know, a personal bias or whatever. I'm not really saying that Jesse is a bigot, but you know, there's no need to propagate a bigot, a bigotry or a, a detrimental looking on something. Well, um, Xi Zhongli has said we weren't working on it. And so you, as a colleague, a science colleague, you believe her until proven otherwise, right? Right. But it's not, but in this case, it's not her. It's somebody else. In yeah, this case, it has nothing right. to do with her. It has to do with has her. to do with whoever was on the Kumar paper or some other paper. It's or, another city. In fact, the sequences were submitted from Guangzhou, if I remember. Yeah. There were an analyst, analysis of Wuhan uh, Ill, Ill patients, but it was published from Guangzhou. No. So what happened is the Guangdong patient or Guangzhou, Guangdong. however, Guangdong, people went and visited Wuhan and then they either went back to Guangdong okay. sick or they came back or they got sick in Wuhan and then either at some point during their illness, whether when they were recovering or whatever, they went back to Guangdong and then they got sequenced there. And so the whole thing is, is that, oh my God, those viruses are more like the bat predecessor than SARS-CoV-2 is and not like the Wuhan market viruses. And it had already been established many months ago that the Wuhan market was not the source. Yeah. And Jesse makes this point in the paper of saying... Makes it over and over and says, over this, and over again. This shows that the Wuhan market, the Huanan fish market, was not the source. But we already knew that. So I don't, I don't know what the point of that is. So it's a totally non-progressive paper. It doesn't tell us anything new. No, it's only a progressive paper in the fact that it makes it so that people that... I know will say things such as, well, who wants to buy Chinese anymore? Uh, I don't want to go for Chinese food. It's like, really? Did you guys think this through? And it's very upsetting. Oh, I don't think they think it through, right? I don't think either person thought it through. The person who wrote the paper or and the person who says, I'm not going to buy Chinese anymore. All right, last one, Amy. Okay. Have you been vaccinated? Yes, I was fully vaccinated in this in, in whatever month, January, and I received Pfizer. Yeah, Amy was vaccinated early because she works in a BSL-3 where they work on SARS-CoV-2. I was vaccinated in February with two doses of Moderna because I am over 65 and New Jersey said, go for it, Vinny. Okay. Um, I got to go write my grant and put on some overlay. All right, Amy, thank you. All right, I'll talk to you tomorrow. You bet. Good night. And I'm not so mad about this. Okay, good night. Okay, hmm. let me get the um, Amy thing off here. Okay. All right, so I got Amy mad, and I thought I only could do that. Um, do T cells bind to totally different epitopes than spike? My understanding is that the epitopes are distinct. There are antibody epitopes or B cell epitopes to which antibodies bind on spike, and then there are T cell epitopes. And remember, there are not ju they are just not just on spike; they can be on other proteins as well. How is T cell receptor shape determined? Well, the T-cell receptor, of course, recognizes the T-cell epitope that's presented by an MHC molecule on the cell surface, major histocompatibility complex molecule. And so there's a pocket in the T-cell receptor, which is formed by the folding of the protein. 
and we make lots of different T cell receptors. Will Xi Zhongli be on TWIV? Well, I haven't asked her, and I'm, I'm, you know, we we're discussing it because we don't want to open her up to more criticism. I mean, you know, we uh, had we had Peter Dashak on a few times, and people use his uh, interview segments out of context, and I don't really like that. I I just don't know yet to answer answer your question. I just don't know. Any thoughts on the Cuban Canada vaccine? They say it's 92.28% effective. Uh, well, it, it's, it could be, right, because the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were, were high as well. So you're absolutely right, Husuario, Husuario. We have to see the data, and we have to see the endpoints for efficacy, right? Because you can't just say efficacy. You have to say we looked for any COVID, any symptomatic COVID, or maybe just moderate to severe, or maybe we look for infection, which is pretty rare in a vaccine trial. But that's what we have to do, for sure. Uh, thank you, Sean, for your contribution. Really appreciate it, folks. All of you who contribute during these live streams, appreciate it. It all goes towards the, the incubator to support producing good science educational materials. Leaky gut from COVID and also in pigs with pig So the question was, those are coronaviruses of pigs, and they wanted to know if there were a leaky gut associated. But I'm not, I'm not um, f uh, aware of that. Do you think that positive cases should be counted only with PCR? Here in Brazil, cases are at an all-time high, but 50% of those are rapid tests for IgG, IgM. I, just, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. Remember, a PCR will tell you someone who's currently infected or has been rec very recently infected. And, of course, there's always the caveat that some people shed RNA for a long time. Antibody arises towards the end of the symptomatic phase of infection, so it's not going to help you with quarantining or, or you know, putting people uh, aside so that they don't transmit. But I also... I, so I think... If you want to know active infections, you do PCR, but you also need a cycle threshold to know if you're shedding, if you are at risk for transmission to others. How do I talk people out of adhering so fanatically to the Delta variant and be more transmissible? It's very difficult. That's why we are writing this op-ed. Um, and, you know, when the, all the major news outlets say it and People say it, lead, country leaders, health leaders, epidemiologists, and so forth, when they all say it. Here's, here's the thing. A few months ago, I wrote to a New York Times writer. I said, your narrative on the variants is all wrong. And I explained it. And she said, you're the only one who says that. And that's just not right. I'm not the only one. I consult many of my colleagues who agree that they're not been, they have not been shown to be more transmissible. What they do is they spread really well. Uh, to displace another variant. That's not the same as transmissibility. How do you do it? I think it's really hard. I think you should just say there's some scientists who uh, are not on with that narrative and we're going to have to take time to figure it out. In the meantime, and this is the key, just get vaccinated. That'll take care of it. it will not evade the vaccine. I know a vaccinated person might be infected without becoming sick and still infect someone else. Has that been documented? So here's the thing. If, so in general, here's how vaccines work. You make antibodies in T cells. And af within a year after vaccination, the levels of those antibodies in T cells drop very to very low levels in the blood, in tissues, in mucosal surface, and so forth. So then you, let's say you encounter... SARS-CoV-2 in a year after vaccination. It's very likely it's going to enter your nasopharynx and it's going to start reproducing, right? And it will take two days for the memory cells to start cranking out antibodies for the memory T cells to wake up and proliferate. And in those two days, you'll get some reproduction. But then the antibodies in the T cells will clamp down on it. So my feeling is you're not going to transmit. However, in the case of COVID vaccines, that hasn't been looked at. They've looked at inhibition of infection. And there is some inhibition of infection, which, of course, then would imply that you're not transmitting. However, 
those studies were done within a short period after immunization when antibody and T-cell levels are very high. It, it's, they're not meaningful at that point. You have to do them a year out when the levels are low, and then you will see most people get infected, but they simply will not get disease, and I don't think they will tr transmit because they won't be making enough virus because in two days the kick-in or the antibody and T-cell response will keep the levels very low. There's a new machine that they claim can sniff out COVID. It samples air, then mixes it and tests. Yeah, I've heard of that also. And it's, yeah, I mean, what do you do when the alarm goes off? It depends. You have to use it under certain situations, right? I don't know how it's going to be used. It's a great question. I know antibody production and general immunity don't rise for two to three weeks post dose one, but how long does dose two take to kick in the extra? Another couple of weeks, but it continues to mature, right? The antibody response matures. You get more and more high affinity antibodies made and better and better memory in, say, six months after that, that second boost. Is there any reliable home test that does not require sending the sample? It depends. You know, there are... There are home antibody and antigen tests, and I'm not sure about PCR. You guys can correct me. There might be some where you can do There might There are some that you can do at home, but you need a prescription. That may have changed recently. I haven't really kept up on it. What is the possible mechanism for the vaccine to cause heart inflammation? Well, one is that we know that in COVID, at least one paper, which we did on TWIV, showed that the spike protein of the virus seems to cause fusion or damage to heart muscle cells. And of course, when a, when a cell or a tissue in you is damaged, that causes inflammation. Your immune system reacts. There's damaged cells here. We got to fix it. And that's inflammation. So that it could be that the vaccine is getting to the heart, but, you know, that's going to be hard to prove. You would have to look at it in an animal model and extrapolate to people. Uh, but whatever it is, it's really rare. And I'm, I'm sure it'll be sorted out, but it's going to take time, right? It's not going to happen overnight. What do I think of nature? You mean the journal or, you know, the trees outside? I, I know you mean the journal. Okay, so nature, cell, in science are called luxury journals. They, you submit a paper and most of them they don't even look at. And they end up reviewing a very small fraction and publishing even less. And the idea is they want to make it exclusive. So if you're published in Cell Science or Nature, you could say, oh, I got a paper there and it's really hard to get in. So that's an artificial exclusivity done by the editors of the journal. It's BS. So there are some really good papers there, and there are some, what's the word for something really smelly? There's some stinkers. And so just because it's published there doesn't mean it's good. And that's certainly been amplified during this pandemic when they're publishing more and more COVID stuff. Why? Because they want to get eyeballs. They want people to subscribe. These journals are making money off of the research of scientists. And scientists, by the way, have to pay to, to publish in them. That's perverse, right? How perverse is that? Publishing is screwed up, but it's not going to be fixed anytime soon. And is it where I publish? I have, in the old days, published a few. And the problem is, if you want a job, if you want a grant, if you want to make a name for yourself... You need to publish in those journals. Why? Well, here's an example. There's a search committee at a university. They, they have a job opening, and they have people who have interviewed, and the people send in their list of publications. And, and many committees say, oh, look at 10 cell papers. Let's take them without even reading the papers, by the way. So Cell Science Nature by itself is an endorsement, which, of course, is perverse also. Anyway, I could go on, but that's what I think about it. I don't publish it anymore in those journals but Amy wants to and she should because she wants to get a position on her own and the only way she's going to do it is, is to publish in those journals and I can't tell her not to I can't tell anyone not to publish because they need it to get jobs to get grants etc what 
What's the efficacy against mild to asymptomatic and moderate disease? The efficacy of what? The vaccines? Well, it depends on which vaccine because not all of them test all three. You know, some of them are 100% against severe disease and death. Um, asymptomatic, very few have been tested against. And so, yes, in a vaccine trial, if you wanted to look for asymptomatics, you have to test people regularly, right? Because they're not going to have symptoms. So you have to do a swab every few days. It's a, it's a logistic nightmare, right? Why vaccinate children? Well, first of all, it's not the innate immune system only that's going to help them out. Because, but kids don't get sick as often as adults. But it's not zero, as Daniel Griffin says. And they can develop serious effects like multi-system inflammatory disease, which is really nasty. And so if it's your kid and you don't vaccinate and they get really sick, I don't think you're going to feel so good. So that's the reason. You're supposed to take care of your kids as a parent, right? If there are two different viruses infecting the same cell, are there issues with them being properly assembled? Uh, that's a good question. It depends how different they are. So it's not just assembly. It could be the whole spectrum of the reproduction cycle, right? Uh one virus could do something to the cell that takes away what the other virus needs. And that could affect protein production. It could affect movement in the cell. It could affect assembly. So, yeah. And you could make more defective particles. Uh, and so that is more, very likely to happen when you have two different viruses infecting the same cell. You're not going to get recombinants because they're different, very different viruses, but they could interfere with each other. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Very, very long COVID. Um, I, many people are working on it. There's, there's a lot of investment. There will be treatments. It's not going to happen overnight, but these because these things are complicated. You know, we're lucky that we got a vaccine in less than a year. But people are working on it, and we'll keep covering it, and something will happen at some point. Why are we lagging in testing? Well, who's we, though? Uh, U.S., the rest of the world, much, much of the world has no resources for testing. Uh, here in the U.S., it's lagging. Because there's a general reduction in interest, right? Vaccination is lagging. Uh, people are just not getting tested. They feel sniffly and they don't get tested. I don't think it's a supply chain issue. Yeah, HPV is not approved for people over 45 because the assumption is by then you're already infected. You get infected in your teens most likely, so it's not going to be of much use. I remember, folks, put my name in front if you want to ask a question. What's the science behind asymptomatics? So asymptomatics happen with many virus infections. There's nothing new with COVID. We've known this for years. 90% uh, of poliovirus infections are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And what's the science behind it? We don't know, and there's no unifying principle. There are a lot of possibilities. But it's very hard to study because up until recently, we couldn't look at the genetic makeup of a person say, sequence their genome and say, oh, here's a mutation and this person is asymptomatic. And let's see, if we see that in, in a thousand other people, then maybe that's significant. And so those kinds of studies are just underway. Why are some people mildly infected and others more seriously? We'll know at some point. But the tech is only recent to sort that out, right? Genome-wide association studies. How do you deal with irrational anti-vaxxers? Um, it, um, it is not easy because they are very devoted to what they think. 
the the only ones who you can begin to approach are the ones who are kind of on the fence. And then I think the best way is to make it personal. My whole family had the vaccine, you know, and they're all fine. And my friends all had it. And just because if you take it, then maybe that helps. But, you know, the the science of, of vaccine denial has been studied extensively. And one of the conclusions is that it doesn't help to spew more facts at people, right? So I just say, look, what are you worried about? I understand you're worried. Tell me, and I try to explain it. And if that doesn't work, then you you have to end with uh, my family had it, and I would recommend any family had it. That's right. The HPV vaccine is an anti-cancer vaccine. That's right. And, of course, many parents don't want their kids to get it because they're under the impression uh, that um, it will make them more promiscuous, which, of course, uh, isn't true. But that's I, – I, I teach a I, – I used to in pre-COVID. I actually did it last year on Zoom. I go to a local high school and teach them about science, five or six classes. And I usually, I, usually it's an English class, and they've just read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And the English teacher wants me to explain the science to them. So I always get a question, why don't my parents want me to get the HPV vaccine? <laughs> and I try to explain it to them. I once said, because they think it's going to make you more promiscuous, and they all laughed really loudly. You know, in a way, young kids are great because they're... Well, they're not adults yet, right? Does the triangular rotational symmetry of the S increase ACE affinity? No, what increases affinity, there's an interface between the spike and the ACE2, where the two proteins join, right? I, I don't have a model. This, this coronavirus that I have back here is um, an antibody bound to spike. But it's basically, if you picture them as... The proteins having an interface. There are amino acids that are interacting across the interface. And there are six crucial amino acids that determine the affinity of binding. Is the concurrent emergence of similar variants an indication that mutation spectrum is limited or a sign of similar selection? Well, that's a very good question. I, I happen to think that the spectrum is limited. You can't change every amino acid in spike. And so that's going to limit it. But I also think that uh, we have immunized most people with just spike, right? And so you're making antibodies against spike. So there's selection pressure against spike imposed by the antibodies. And I think that's driving the, the selection as well. I think the um, – and even – that extends to infected and recovered people. Their antibodies, the ones that are imposing selection pressure are the ones on spike because those antibodies will block attachment and infection. And therefore, if the virus can change one amino acid so that it can infect and get around the, the antibody, that will be selected for. So I think you see similar variants arising in different locales, convergent evolution. That's probably a combination of those two. Do you still recommend TWIV on the 1918? I don't think we did one on 1918 pandemic, frankly. Uh, I wanted to get um, one of the CDC scientists or NIH scientists who had recovered the 1918 virus, but he canceled. I also wanted to get, um, no, I'm blanking on the name, another person. Oh, uh, John, the guy who wrote the, the, the great influenza, John, anyway, you, you guys know his name. Uh, he's, he's agreed in principle to come on. I never followed up with him. Uh, so all this scheduling of TWIV, besides the recording and the, the scoping of the science, I do it all, and I need some help, which uh, reminds me, folks, so for the new studio, eventually I'm going to need a part-time technical producer. If you know what that is, well, if you don't know what it is, it's okay. But if you know what a technical producer is, I need someone during the shows to do video switching, okay? And um, it'll be a part-time position. 
in uh, on Seventh Avenue in New York City. So if you're interested, shoot me an email. Please teach us more about influenza. <laughs> Well, we, we've talked a lot about influenza on TWIV. In fact, the, the last pandemic was 2009, right? Um, we talked a lot about that as it emerged and spread around the world. And I have a, a lecture, a series of lectures in my virology course that would educate you as well. We only have 15 minutes left here, so I can't tell you very much about it. But the next pandemic will probably be an influenza pandemic because they tend to happen every 20 to 30 years. So... We um, had one in 2009, so you can do the math. Do T cells have a way to avoid killing viral infected cells at a time that would release infectious particles? No, they do not. They do not. So, you know, for s that's a good question because for some viruses, they're assembled inside the cell. They're complete. So if you break open the cell, they'll all come out, right, and infect other cells. But many viruses have to bud right, from the surface, and so you could break open the cell. There'd be no infectious particles inside. SARS-CoV-2 mature inside the cell, so breaking it open. But, no, there's no way that the T cell knows that. It just kills a cell that is displaying a viral uh, antigen on the surface. And I think in the long run, it works out okay, because even if it releases a lot of viruses, then other T cells can take care of those infected cells. Uh, can you comment on the Alzheimer drug approval controversy? I, I cannot. This is not my field. I'm sure others can uh, do so better than I. Uh, you wouldn't want to be in 7th Avenue. Well, you know, Penn Station is a busy place all hours. We were looking at space on 8th Avenue. It was a little dicier there. That would have been rough after, say, 7 p.m. Any guesses about why AstraZeneca causes thrombocytopenia? You know, some, some adenoviruses uh, bind platelets. That's been known for years, so people are sorting that out. It could be uh, the vector. Uh, we'll see. Poor bats get a bad rap. Um, they do, but you know, rodents are more numerous than bats. 20% of mammals are bats, but 40% of mammals are rodents, and they have a lot of viruses, and they can infect us as well. So the bats have taken this focus away from the rodents. <laughs> Looking back, my biggest surprise was finding out that the virus is more airborne than spread via surfaces. What has been your biggest surprise? So, yes. Well, respiratory viruses tend to be Airborne, although rhinoviruses are a lot of contact spread, as you would say here. What's my biggest surprise about the biology of the virus? I guess that we have such a big fraction of immunopathology, right? You have this initial um, viral phase of, say, a week or two. Most people recover, and then a fraction, and it's age-dependent, go on to develop more severe disease, which is immunopathologic. Now, the idea that a viral disease can be immunopathological, that is driven by immune responses, we, that's nothing new. But I suppose um, the extent of it is amazing to me because so many people are infected because we see it with MERS coronavirus infections. We saw it with SARS-CoV-1. We see it with avian influenza, but there are far fewer infections with those, right? So I guess the scale was pretty stunning to me. I, bet it'll, I don't know. It's not published yet, but it should be out in the next week. They're putting us through the, the, the ringer. <laughs> you can mix doses. No problem. We now know you can mix not only mRNA vaccines of different sorts. You could also mix... Uh, vectored and um, mRNA vaccines as well. It's not a problem. Spike is a spike. As a scientist, I can't say 100% certainty, although I'm, I will for this, and uh, it's a possibility, but there's zero evidence for it. In science, we go with the evidence, right? And I have a lot of evidence that it's natural, and none 
In fact, it's not even a lab leak hypothesis. I call it a lab leak notion because there's no evidence for it. So I, I agree that you can't, um, it's a, it is a possibility, but I think it's been ruled out because there's no evidence for it. And there's sometimes in science communication where you have to be um, definitive, and that's hard for a scientist to do. A friend told me the RNA, the RN, gave, registered nurse giving him an mRNA vaccine, told him to rub his arm to spread the vaccine better. No, 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 no. This is a deep muscle injection. Rubbing your arm is not going to spread it. It's going, the long needle, right? It's like an inch, inch and a half needle, depending on your size. It goes deep into the muscle. Rubbing it's not going to do anything. <laughs> a physician from India reported he definitely observed a lot of ADE. So when a physician says, I definitely saw that, I would say the opposite. Probably not. Oh, you can't just say you have ADE by looking at the, the symptoms. You have to, well, first of all, there's no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 causes ADE because as far as we know, there's one serotype and you would have to have recovered or been vaccinated and then get reinfected, confirmed reinfection, get a more severe disease. They'd have to take antibodies out of you and show that they enhance infection. You cannot do it just by looking at symptoms. Absolutely not. Um, this is the sort of thing that would never be reported on, but of course, since we're in a pandemic, everything is reported on. A lot of things here are pretty old in this conversation. So I've forgotten some of them. Uh, my pregnant wife refused the vaccine. Her water broke early. Baby arrived 30 weeks. But I thought if she got the vaccine, we would have blamed this on the vaccine. Sean, you are so right. There's no way you could have convinced her that the vaccine did not cause the early birth. Absolutely. And that's part of the problem. Yep. It's great. Publish the op-ed on blog. Yes, I will do that. You bet. Oh, Kang, thank you so much for bringing this up. Isn't there a behavioral factor in calculating R0? Yes, there is. And as far as I can tell, they never use, they never take that into consideration when they calculate the transmission index for the variants. It's only the number of new cases over so many days. And so, yes, I think human behavior is accounting for it. There's more interaction. How can they do that without taking that into account? I don't understand, but that's what they're doing. And so, yes, you are you got it right on the nose. The, the equation has a couple of variables, and a couple of them have to do with the virus, and one of them has to do with how long people are in contact uh, to be able to transmit. The average science comprehension of this podcast is 99%. I think this is very high. These are people, you are people who seek out science information. You are the people who have listened to my pods over the years. You're the low-hanging fruit. The, the others are harder to reach. And maybe the incubator will allow me to experiment and try and reach them. Uh, you said a few weeks ago... The next pandemic will be flu. Uh, why? Well, it's just a matter of timing. They happen every 20 to 30 years. So 2009, 20 years would be 2029. And, and the next coronavirus, well, I don't think there'll be a corona pandemic for a while. You know, there have been new coronaviruses emerging every 10 years, right? Every decade. But a, a pandemic of this magnitude is pretty rare. So I think one of this magnitude will not happen for a while. But either way, um, you know, for flu, we can respond pretty quickly. We can make a vaccine quickly, as we did for this virus. We have antivirals that work. We're a little better prepared for a flu pandemic. I'm really hoping we'll be better prepared for the next coronavirus pandemic. Thank you, Wild Bunny, for listening to us. Well, you should listen to other scientists, but they're not, they don't communicate very much, right? No, this is not true. Uh, breastfeeding, of course, prevents babies. It gives you antibodies and breast milk, and it's well known to prevent 
infections in babies. That's simply not true. Uh, what was the site that I referenced that tracked different viruses? Maybe it was the um, wildfire site. So what wildfire, is it wildfire? I'm getting my names wrong. Wildfire. No, it's not wildfire. It is... Ah, I can't remember the name. It's not wildfire. There's a company in Colorado that does the respiratory PCR, gut PCR panels. and Anyway, that was the... If it, Amy would know. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I don't remember it. Someone else would think it up. Perhaps the incubator could offer suggestions of programming. Well, that's my idea. I'm going to reach out and try and do more education and use the medium video mainly because it's good for teaching short educational videos. I'm going to try different things for the rest of my career. That's what I'm going to do. We, we briefly discussed it here, and I will definitely do it on a TWIV uh, in the next week or so. So let's take a look at um, some of the, uh, even though there are lots of good questions, let's look at the super chats and super uh, stickers. Thank you, Genesis Int1, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. HCH, thank you again. I recognize your handle, Post Polio News. Part of the media problem is journalists from all corners of the newsroom are being drafted to write corona pieces. They're out of their depth. That's actually true. I get called by a lot of writers who say, science is not my beat, but I'd like to ask you about coronavirus. I, I um, talked to a science journalist from MIT, Tom Levinson. Some of you may know him. He's writing a piece in Nautilus. And I was just amazed at how he understood. He said to me, basically, I'm appalled at the press coverage of this pandemic. It's just so bad. And he is a science journalist. I mean, he teaches science journalism, right? So check it out. I think it's going to come out tomorrow. Nautilus, Tom Levinson. Really good. He quotes me in it, but that's not why you should read it. Because he, I think he gets it. Thank you, Ditching the Grind 3. Really appreciate your contribution why don't they test birds um, they probably are we will um, find out as time goes on definitely they're definitely looking at many many different animals and birds are quite numerous as well right for sure I'm looking for some people to thank Sandy thank you for your contribution really really very nice of you to support our work and remember folks one of the features of what we do, my philosophy is knowledge should be free. I don't charge for anything. The only thing that's charged is my textbook, but because it's published by the ASM Press and they, they want to make money. If it were up to me, I'd write a textbook and give it away. I really would. I think everyone needs to have knowledge and be able to afford it. That's why all my pods and lectures and everything I do except for the textbook is free. Uh, thank you, Jack, for your contribution. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, there's a video on YouTube that says the vaccines are cytotoxic. Yeah, someone called me this week to, to talk about that. There's no evidence that they're cytotoxic. Uh, the virus is cytotoxic for sure. The spike protein causes cell fusion. That's a form of cytotoxicity. There's no evidence that the vaccine does that. And there's no evidence that it's harmful. So um, it's a possibility, but it's not been seen. Bill, thank you so much. Appreciate you and all the TWIV participants' commitment to explaining facts behind the research and papers, especially preprints and not reviewed. So there won't be a TWIV released tomorrow morning. I took the week off. for Tuesday TWIV, I took the week off. Okay, so we'll have a... A Friday TWIV and a Daniel TWIV as usual. A lot of questions. I'm so tempted to take these other questions, but I want to thank our contributors for supporting 
the incubator. You guys have amazing questions. Thank you, Tom, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Overjoyed. Really appreciate it, Overjoyed. What a great handle, right? All right, so that looks like the uh, the extent of the contributions. Are we better prepared for the next pandemic? No, not yet. I mean, there are two levels of preparedness. Amy always points this out. There's the um, preparedness for the virus, right? Antivirals, um, vaccines, and so forth that could catch the next pandemic strain, even if we don't know what it is. But then there's the political and sociological and economic and all those other effects that you have to be ready for, which we weren't, right? And so I don't, that's not my area. I'm a, I'm a virologist. And um, that's what I think we need to work harder on being prepared for. And I'm just afraid that um, once this is over, people will forget. Now, I think that the current administration wants to put together a pandemic committee to plan for the next one and make sure we have it right. I hope they get the right people, okay? Um, and um, we'll see what happens. But, yeah, as Brian says, well, at least we know that mRNA vaccines can work. You're absolutely right. That's a great way to stop to uh, end this. We know that vaccine, mRNA vaccines work. We could try them right away. But I think we should have some antivirals ready, and we could do that for coronas. All right, folks, a lot of other things we could chat about, but I'll let you all go back to your lives Thank you for coming. Thank you for contributing. Before you go, just pop the like button if you haven't done so already. Again, we get almost 500 people here. Love it. Love it that you want to come and uh, not just listen to us, but chat amongst yourselves about science. It's really important. And then you go back into your communities and um, um, spread the information. What's the plan with the incubator? The incubator is going to be a place where I make content, TWIV and all the other pods and new things. I'm not replacing TWIV. It's just going to be recorded there. I need a place, a quiet, big place where I could reconfigure and expand and do all the things I can't do either here or in my office at Columbia. I will continue to be a Columbia professor for this foreseeable future. All right, folks, have a great evening. Thanks for coming, and um, we will see you next time.